Welcome back to In The Midst. This is going to be the last video for 2021. So happy New Year's Eve. Um, I hope everyone is safe tonight, making good decisions, and I hope everyone has a wonderful 2022. I am very excited to see what this year brings, not only for me personally, my family, but just what God is going to do. So today we're going to start a new series. I believe this is just a three-part series this time on having respect in marriage. So this is a big deal. Um, I'm hoping to give you a little bit of a new take, a new perspective on the word respect, on how to implement that in your marriage, what that looks like. Um, for all of us, it's going to be a little different. There's things that I do to show respect to my husband that don't necessarily apply to you, and that's okay. And we're going to talk about different things like love and respect, how they go together, how they're actually separated, and how we both respond to them a little differently. So today is just going to be part one. And the first thing I want to start off saying is something that you're probably like, duh, but um, it needs to be said. So you are married. Stop living like you're single. One of the biggest complaints that I see, one of the biggest trends that I see among marriages is, yes, we're married, but we're still doing our own thing, living our own life. We have our own friends. We don't do things together. Um, we spend a lot of time apart. You have your hobbies. I have mine. You have your agenda, your schedule. I have mine. And we're not coming together very often. This is not okay. If you're not consulting your spouse on things, you're not doing things together. When you get married, two flesh become one. So you are now one flesh, one being, um, I guess it's not really the word I want to use, but you're one flesh. So you should be operating together as a unit together. Okay. That's why you got married. If you didn't want to do that, then you should have stayed single. So your finances, your friends, your schedules are no longer yours alone. You're not making decisions for yourself. You're not saving money for yourself. You're not spending money for yourself. You're not choosing friends for yourself. Everything you do from here on out needs to be for the betterment, for the advantage of us. It's not me anymore. It's us. So you need to realize that you are on the same side. You two are on the same team. You are one. There is nothing that you can do that is not going to affect your spouse. Every choice you make, every decision, every dollar, everything is going to affect your spouse. Just because they might not know about it yet does not mean that it's not going to affect them. Mark 10, 8, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. Matthew 19, 6. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Have you considered how this truth applies directly specifically to your marriage this isn't just some good idea this isn't just something that god thought would sound good or something that looks good on the wedding invitations this applies to you um god himself ordained marriage and we hear that we believe that we know there's a biblical foundation we know god has a plan and a design but have you taken that truth personally God has ordained your marriage. God wants to work in your marriage. God wants your marriage to last a lifetime. He wants your marriage to honor and glorify Him. Where you are right now, doesn't matter the condition of your marriage, how long you've been married, this truth applies to you. God is for you. God is for your marriage. Some of this it's going to develop and make more sense as time goes on in your marriage. There are things that you're going to continue to learn. You're going to continue to grow. But if you don't start, you're never going to get there. So you need to start today. Tomorrow's the first day of the new year. Start tomorrow with having God in your marriage, with looking to the Bible to build your marriage on biblical foundations. See what God says about marriage. What does he say is allowed or not? Um, you know, you, uh, we have to look to his word and you guys have to learn to function as a team. You are one flesh. Um, one of the things that I struggled with the most was consulting with my husband about decisions and not things like 
finances. It was just my time, my schedule. Um, I got married at a young age. And so when I got married, um, I wasn't 18 yet. So I had a lot of those advantages that you don't normally get until you're 18. I could do a lot of things. I could make my own decisions, sign my own, um, you know, financial responsibility, make decisions for my child, all these things. Um, couldn't vote, you know, some of that stuff is still age dependent, but in my mind, I was now an adult. I was a wife. I was, had responsibilities. Um, I moved out, moved in with my husband. He already had his own place. So all this is up to me. I have to clean my house. I have to do my laundry. I have to prepare the meals. I have to do the grocery shopping. So in my mind, I was an adult. So to come to my husband and say, Hey, do you mind if I do this? Do you think we can do this? At that time, it felt a lot like asking permission and I did not like it. I was immature still. Um, and I struggled with that and we had some serious conversations about it and I just, I didn't like it, but consulting your spouse and asking permission are not the same. We have to consult them. This is part of marriage. This is part of maturity. You're not asking, Hey, can I do this? It's, you have to think of it like, this is what I would like to do, but I don't know if you've already made plans. If there's something you would like to do instead, do I need to move this? Do I need to wait? Um, whatever. I mean, you know, you want to go out with your friends on Friday night. Maybe he had a date night planned. He was going to surprise you, but because you just got off work, you came home, you changed clothes and you left where he got home and you didn't talk to him. Now that's ruined. So it's not a matter of like, Oh, I can't make decisions. I can't do anything that I want to do. It's that's not what marriage is. You just have to consult each other with what you want to do. Um, so many things that I've shared on here through my blog, um, are things that I had to learn and this, is one of them. So it's a process. Okay. And that's okay. But just realize that you need to work towards something. We're working toward functioning as a unit. Um, no matter how small something seems, just share with your spouse what it is that's going on. Make sure they don't have something else planned at the time. Do not view this as asking permission because if you do, this is going to bring bitterness and resentment in your marriage. And that's not something that God wants. Satan is the author of division, not the Lord. And that's what's going to happen is this is going to bring division in your marriage. Um, Proverbs 27, 17, iron sharpeneth iron. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Is there a friend or influence hobby, something in your life that your spouse does not like? Maybe it's books that you read. And he doesn't like them. It's, uh, movies that you watch, um, a TV show that he doesn't like. Maybe it's a social media app. You know, if your husband doesn't want you on Snapchat, then don't get on Snapchat. But whatever it is, um, you guys need to talk about it. But you need to trust their instinct. You need to trust their judgment. You need to be respectful of them saying, hey, I just, I really don't like this. I'm not comfortable with this. We are, as far as social media goes, we are a no Snapchat house at all. Um, no TikTok either. Um, I have Instagram. I have my blog. We both have Facebook. My husband's not on Instagram. He's not on anything else. Um, I don't have a Twitter account, anything like that. That's just, no. Um, that's just one of the things that we don't do. We don't feel like it's appropriate. There's nothing good that's going to come from that. So we don't go there. And that's just one way that I respect the things that my husband wants is I don't feel like this is a good app. It's, we don't need more social media. We don't need more time on our phones. So I don't have it. Everyone else does. And we have friends that, you know, they share their TikTok and their reels to Facebook or they find one that's funny and they text it to us. That's fine. But to have that access ourselves and be on there, it's not. Um, another thing, neither one of us watch scary movies. That's just not something we do. It's just not necessary. It's not needed. There's enough darkness in the world without that. Um, we don't do it. I personally don't feel like romance novels are okay. They're not okay for me. Um, I went, I want my husband watching certain things, so I don't watch those things. You know, if you don't want your husband watching a movie that's, you know, explicit scenes, 
then why is it okay for you to read a book that's explicit scenes? Now you've got that image in your head and it's going to change your mood and all that stuff. If you do, that's fine. That's between you and the Lord, you and your husband. But for me, that's just not somewhere we go. Um, that's just one of the ways I respect him. I don't want my husband watching a bunch of movies or anything with half-naked people. So I'm not going to watch things like that. Even though if it's just a TV show, it's just a movie, it's just whatever. Um, so I'm not comfortable with it. He respects that. He's not comfortable with it. I respect that. It's just, this is how marriage works, okay? Um, you might think that there's nothing wrong or inappropriate with that hobby, with that person. You might even think that your spouse is overreacting by saying, hey, I don't like this. But we have to, we have to communicate, first of all, but you have to trust them. Nothing is worth your marriage. Being able to indulge in that book, in that friendship, in that hobby, in that movie, um, in that social media platform, it's not worth your marriage. It's not worth your husband being upset with you. It's not worth the division that it's going to bring. Um, you just, and you have to think of this on the flip side. If you went to your husband and said, hey, I noticed that you spend a lot of time with this person and I just, I don't know what it is. I'm just not comfortable. I don't think they're a good influence. Um, you know, your mood really changes when you're around them, whatever, social media, movies, books, whatever you want to put in there. If he didn't listen to you, if he didn't at least say, can you explain this a little more? What are you talking about? Give me an example. Um, you would be upset. You know, as women, when we say we have an instinct, we have a feeling, we have a suspicion, we expect that to be the law and you have to listen to me, but we don't give our husband that same respect. So just be careful with that. You know, you would want him to listen to you if you brought that concern to him. Um, if your spouse ignored that and kept that relationship, hobby, whatever, you would be upset. So just don't, don't do that. It's not worth it. When you ignore your spouse and they are uncomfortable warnings, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Um, that's not showing love and respect. That's not saying our marriage is a priority to me. What you're saying is the thing that I like is a priority to me and you're not. This is more important than you. This is more important than our marriage. And it's not going to last like that. That's not how you build a relationship. Um, it's okay to say, can we talk about this? Can you explain this to me? You know, marriage isn't to be a dictatorship. We're supposed to communicate, but at the end of the day, it's not popular, but the husband has the final say. You might not agree with, you know, the husband says we're not doing Snapchat, but if that's what he says, then that's what we, biblically, that's what we should do. You must communicate your point of view, your thoughts, your concerns clearly saying just because, or I just don't like it is not always enough. If you are on the receiving end of this request, it's up to you to be considerate and to openly listen to your spouse. Do not ask them, hey, why do you feel this way? Just so we can argue about it. It's not what this is for. I've always wondered what would have happened if Eve would have gone to Adam in the garden. What if she would have went to him and said, hey, you know, there's a serpent over there in the forbidden fruit tree. And he was talking to me and this is what he said. But you said this. He said this. Can you, what's going on? Adam probably would have walked over there and talked to that serpent. So my husband would have done. He'd have been like, who are you? Why are you talking to my wife? And what are you saying? Um, you know, if she would have went to him before. If she would have said, hey, this is what the serpent said. Um, it kind of turned my attention to the tree. I'm kind of struggling with this. Can you help me? Maybe things would have turned out differently. Do you go to your husband when you're struggling with something? Or when you have a question about something? You know, my Bible says this, you said this, God said this, but Janice over there said whatever, or there's a mommy Facebook group and somebody said whatever. Um, take those things to him. Your husband is the priest of the home. He is. God's given him that position for a reason. Go to him. And I know, of course, this is all speculation, but what if? You know, we know there's safety in good counsel. Ask your spouse their opinion on decisions that you want to make. Sometimes all we need to hear is a verbal reassurance from someone we know and trust. Nothing, nothing should be hidden from your spouse. Um, this includes conversations that you have with others that make you question your faith or God's will for you. You know, 
we have good counsel. Not everybody knows your will or God's will for your life. Um, you could be getting other good godly counsel. But if it's contrary to what your husband said, I feel like this is what God wants. You need to go to him and be like, have you thought about this? What about this? You know, should, do we need to pray about this? And if he says, no, I've got a peace. This is what we need to do. Then, okay, this is what we need to do. It doesn't matter how good that other counsel is. If it's not what God said, it doesn't matter. Just like with Eve, Satan wants you to doubt God's word. Take these thoughts to God in prayer and to your spouse for reassurance and comfort. No secrets means no secrets. Doesn't mean little secrets. Doesn't mean a secret every now and again. No means no. Share these things with each other. The world's philosophy of asking for forgiveness rather than permission will ruin your marriage. Do not use this tactic. It doesn't work. Um, this is what Satan wants you to do. This is part of his plan of this is being selfish. This is getting your own way. This is like, I can still do what I want. And it's taking your spouse for granted. It's taking their forgiveness, their kindness, their patience. Um, that's not how God wants your marriage to work. We see over and over where this didn't work out well in the Bible. With, like with Eve, her actions led to consequences, not just for her and Adam, but for all of humanity. Like we are still legit living in the consequences of her sin. We are. It does not just affect you. David's sin with Bathsheba. Asking for forgiveness didn't bring back the two lives that were lost as a result of his sin. God's in the restoring business. God's in the forgiving business. Absolutely 110%. But if he never would have done that, if Bathsheba wouldn't have done that, consented to that, she was just as much at fault as David. Don't get me wrong. Um, Uriah wouldn't have died and their baby wouldn't have died. You know, those are things that you can't change. You know, you are free to choose your sin. You are free to choose your actions. You are not free to choose the consequences of your actions. And you don't know what those consequences are going to be. We all play the scenario in our mind of we know how it's going to work out. We know what's going to happen. When one person says this, this is what I'm going to say. Um, or they're never going to know. The Bible reminds us that be sure your sin will find you out. God's not blind to what you're doing, even if you think everybody else is. Um, Abraham having a child with Hagar, it was Sarah's request. It's what she wanted. It's not what God promised Abraham was going to happen. It's not how he said the child was going to come. But this led to a huge mess. And again, that's one of the things we are still living in the consequences of today. Remember how important it is to trust the Lord. Communicate with your spouse. God desires us to operate in unity. You cannot be one flesh if you're living separate lives. Satan thrives in an environment of division, discontentment, um, doubt. That's where Satan wants you to live. Don't give him an open door into your marriage. Whether you are arguing or probably even worse, not speaking at all, will affect others. Everyone sees it. You're not hiding it. Satan will use this any way he can to bring about the most hurtful complete destruction as possible. That's his agenda, is to destroy. Satan doesn't want to just bother you a little bit or annoy you a little bit or frustrate you. He wants to completely destroy your marriage. Um, one of the biggest things that you can do is keep control of your tone to show respect to your spouse. Um, no one ever feels loved, respected, heard, valued when they're being yelled at, screamed at, belittled, cussed at, anything like that. That is not how you talk to your spouse. You need to remember that your spouse is God's child and God takes care of his kids. Your spouse is um, a gift to you from God. Make sure you steward that gift well. God doesn't have to leave that gift here. God can take his gift, his children home at any time. We're not promised tomorrow. Um, following this principle of maintaining your tone um, while you communicate, it's going to help you communicate much better. You know, I don't know about you, but whenever I get frustrated and I get louder, I get more frustrated and it's a vicious cycle. Um, the Bible is very clear about a soft answer turning away wrath. Um, James 3, 5 through 10 um, even so, the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a word of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body 
and setteth on fire the course of nature and is set on fire of hell. Every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Sounds pretty serious. We know that our tongue can cause a lot of problems and God has to be the one to tame it. We can't. Um, Psalm 141 verse 3, David said, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips. All of us can use that. Never talk down to or about your spouse in public or in private. This includes venting on social media. It's not a good look for you or your spouse. It definitely doesn't bring honor and glory to the Lord. Um, going to your friends, you know, your best friend, calling your mom, all that stuff. It's not going to help anything. Your friends, your parents, um, they're always going to side with you, even if you're in the wrong. Very rarely are they actually going to tell you that this is your fault. Um, this paints a very negative picture for your spouse to them. They're not going to respect your spouse. They're not going to be around your spouse. This brings more division. This brings more of that whole your friends, my friends thing. And when all the fighting is done and we've made up and we're happy and life's great, we don't usually go back and tell that side of the story. So they're left with this negative picture that never gets fixed. Now they don't like your spouse at all. Um, you know, you, whatever you put on social media never goes away. So be careful with what you post. Um, people don't have a clue to the backstory. They don't know what started this argument. All they see is a very, very small snippet of your side of the story and it doesn't do any good. They're going to start giving you their feedback, their opinion of something they know absolutely nothing about. And you're going to listen to that and Satan's going to use that to feed your mind, your emotions. Um, and it's going to make things so much worse. So just a private life is a happy life. When you, what you say about your spouse and how you speak to them will shape how others view and treat them. If you don't respect your spouse, you don't show love to them, other people won't either. Because if you don't do it, they don't have to. If your spouse puts up with that from them, then everyone thinks, well, that's just how they are. They're passive or they, you know, they can be walked on. I should be the example of how my husband's viewed and treated. Um, your spouse can and should stand up for themselves, but you know just as well as I do that if a wife belittles her husband in public, everyone else joins in and now he's the butt of the joke. He's the loser. Really, I mean, you can look at any sitcom on TV and that's what dad is. He's dumb and he's the butt of the jokes and he's just an idiot and mom runs the house. Um, don't let your spouse be viewed that way. So, part one, respecting your spouse. You have to have respect in marriage. The Bible has a lot to say about this. We're going to get into that a little bit later. Um, but just for now, start tomorrow, start the new year with showing respect, appreciation to your spouse. Watch your tone. Don't post negative things on social media and do not speak down to or about your spouse in public or in private. So um, stay in the word, stay close to the shepherd, and let him lead you in paths of righteousness.